Hello my dear young doctors, welcome to Medical Malu. Today we are going to see the topic postpartum hemorrhage. In the third stage complications, there comes this postpartum hemorrhage PPH which includes retent placenta, uterine inversion, morbidly other than placenta etc and also amniotic fluid embolism. In the postpartum hemorrhage, it can be of primary or secondary. The definition goes like this. In primary postpartum hemorrhage, there is loss of more than 500 ml of blood within 24 hours of the childbirth. And for cesarean section, it is more than 1000 ml. In secondary postpartum hemorrhage, there is bleeding after 24 hours of labor and up to 6 weeks of postpartum. In the postpartum hemorrhage, what are the causes? First one is atonic postpartum hemorrhage, second traumatic postpartum hemorrhage. It can be due to coagulopathy or it can be due to a retained placenta and placental fragments or morbidly other than placenta or it can be due to uterine inversion. The first one, a tonic postpartum hemorrhage. Here, there is loss of tone of the uterus. Hence, the blood vessels are not obliterated by the contraction and retraction of the uterine muscle fibers. This is what we are expecting in a normal uterus. The uterine wall contracts and also obliterates blood vessels preventing further hemorrhage. But in this atonic uterus, there is loss of tone and hence the blood vessels are not obliterated and there is heavy hemorrhage. What are the predisposing factors for hemorrhage? It can be due to grand multiplicity. It can be due to over distended uterus in case of multiple pregnancy, hydramnios or in macrosomia. If there is history of atonic postpartum hemorrhage, then it is high risk of recurrence. Rapid and prolonged labor, antepartum hemorrhage, an oxytocin induction or augmented labor, if there is any uterine abnormalities or any kind of fibroids, retained placental fragments or in case of mismanagement of third stage labor. The second type is traumatic postpartum hemorrhage. It can be due to instrumental delivery like forceps delivery. It can be due to vaginal birth after cesarean section or in case of macrosomia. Here there is increased size of fetus with increased head circumference too. The third one is coagulopathy. It can be due to DIC or in case of hypofibrinogenemia. The predisposing factors are abruption, sepsis, intrauterine death, amniotic fluid embolism. The fourth type is retained placenta. Here the placental fragments are retained inside the uterus and this retained placenta causes heavy hemorrhage. It can be due to atonic uterine walls. This loss of tone in the uterine wall causes incomplete expulsion of the placenta. And this is the most common cause for the retaining placenta. The second type, due to failure of contraction of retroplacental myometria. There is muscle fibers just behind the attachment of the placenta. If it fails to contract, then the placental fragments are not expelled completely and this causes retaining of the placenta and resulting in continuous bleeding. And it is diagnosed by ultrasonography. And how we manage the retained placenta? We have to give resuscitation for hemorrhage. If soon after the delivery, if there is no bleeding nor no shock with uterus contracted and the internal oses closed, then we can give sublingual GTN, glycerol trinitrate, which is a uterine relaxant and followed by we can have a controlled cord traction. Or if there is very high bleeding or shock, we can give 50 international units of oxytocin in 30 ml saline. It is injected down the umbilical vein to the placental bed with an esogastric tube. And the third case comes if it is not expelled within 60 minutes under general anesthesia or regional anesthesia with tocolytics. We are manually removing the placenta followed by an oxytocin infusion to make the uterus contract. What is the seculae of retained placenta? There can be pupural sepsis, there can be secondary postpartum hemorrhage or it can develop as placental polyp presenting as irregular bleeding. The fifth cause is morbidly other than placenta which means the abnormal placentation in the myometria. Normally, the placenta is attached to the decidual basalis, but here there is defective decidual formation. Actually, it may be absent, and it is seen at histopathological examination. 
and due to this defective distal formation, this placentation is at the abnormal site being in the myometria. The high risk factors are previous cesarean section where there is scar adherence of the placenta, also seen in placenta previa, which is a low-lying placenta. In the histopathological examination, there is no decidua basalis, and the Nitta books layer is absent. It is a layer of fibronoid degeneration seen at the junction of placental trophoblast and the decidua. Usually, it is present to prevent the invasion of the placenta into the myometria, and here, this layer is absent. This defective decidua can be focal, partial, or complete type. Based on the level of invasion of this placenta, we are dividing this morbidly adherent placenta into three types. First one is placenta accreta, where the villi are attached superficially to the myometria. This is the myometrial layer and the villi are just superficially attached to it. In the second type, the placenta increta villi invade much more into the myometria. See, in this figure, the villi invades much more than the placenta accreta and it has almost invaded the myometria. In the third type, placenta percreta, the villi penetrates into the myometrium and up to the serosa and sometimes it may even come out of the serosa. That you can see in this figure. It has almost completely invaded into the myometrium and reached up to the level of the serosa and some villi have entered out of it also. And these three, placenta accreta, increta and percreta are the subtypes of morbidly adherent placenta. What is the major clinical feature? It is antipartum hemorrhage. How we diagnose the case? It is by ultrasonography with Doppler, which is done antenatally. And in this, we notice there is no zone of separation. And how we manage? In case of focal and partial invasion, we can manually remove it. It may be a successful. But in case of complete invasion, we go for classical cesarean section to deliver the baby followed by a total hysterectomy and this is more specially done in placenta percreta invading the urinary bladder. The sixth case is inversion of the uterus. Here the fundus has inverted into the uterine cavity. What are the etiology? It is most commonly due to mismanagement of the third stage of labor where the placental cord is pulled before the separation of the placenta from the fundus or from the uterine wall. Or it can be due to a tonic uterus where there is spontaneous inversion of the fundus. It can be classified into various headings. It can be classified as complete as well as incomplete. In complete, the fundus is outside the cervix whereas in incomplete, the fundus is inside the cervix. It can be classified as primary, secondary as well as tertiary. In primary, there is simple dimpling of the fundus. In secondary, the fundus protrudes through the internal os and it comes into the vagina. In tertiary, the fundus protrudes through the vaginal introitus out of the body. It can also be classified as acute, subacute or chronic. In acute, it occurs within 24 hours of delivery, whereas in subacute, it occurs between 24 hours to 4 weeks of postpartum, whereas in chronic, it occurs after 4 weeks of postpartum. And how we diagnose this? It can be diagnosed on abdominal examination where we feel the fundus is absent or we have to suspect it if there is very high severe shock and hemorrhage and the hemorrhage or shock is out of proportion to the bleed. There is a way to prevent it by proper controlled contraction only after separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. If we are properly doing it, then we can avoid this kind of situations. Regarding the management, we have to go for resuscitation immediately along with replacement of the inverted fundus back into the proper position. It is done simultaneously. The first choice is manual replacement under general anesthesia and with tocolytics. We are pushing the inverted part back into the proper site. We have to keep this in mind. The part that came first must be the last one to go in. After repositioning, the placenta is removed and it is not removed before the correction. Then we are giving oxytocin for the proper contraction of the uterus. The second method is hydrostatic method of O. Sullivan. 
where the warm saline is run into the vagina, keeping the labia manually opposed, and hence the vagina balloons and corrects the inversion. And finally, we can go for surgery and done only if our other measures fail. Let's see the management of PPH as a whole. First of all, the general management. We have to give fluid replacement. We can give blood component therapy like fresh frozen plasma, packed cells, etc. Send for investigations like hemoglobin, hematocrit, cross-matching, etc. And do a proper monitoring, mainly the pulse rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, urine output, etc. The first management is medical methods, where oxytocin is the first line of treatment followed by ergometrin or we can go for prostaglandin analogs like PGF2 alpha or PGE1 etc. If it fails then go for mechanical methods. First of all we will be doing a bimanual compression where one hand is put inside the vagina and the other hand above on top of the abdomen approximating the uterine wall in between the two hands and hence this compression decreases the bleeding. There is another option of uterine packing but it is not done today. We can go for balloon tamponade where we are using hydrostatic balloon catheters. And there is one more option like quantum tamponade. All these has to be followed with oxytocin infusion. If all these fails then we can go for surgical methods. There are options like under sewing where the placental bed is sutured with figure of eight or purse string sutures and it is done at cesarean section for placenta previa. We can do a choice multiple block sutures where we approximate the anterior and the posterior walls of the uterus. And these are the block sutures where the anterior and the posterior walls are sutured together and the uterine cavity is thus reduced. Next option is B lynch sutures. We are suturing the uterus like this. We are pulling out these sutures will make this uterus contracted and become a compacted mass and hence we can reduce much amount of bleeding by this method. Another option is systematic pelvic devascularization where initially the uterine arteries are ligated followed by ovarian arteries and if still bleeding internal iliac arteries are also ligated. And the final option where everything fails we have to do a hysterectomy to save the life of the mother. And this is the flow chart of management of postpartum hemorrhage. Initially, we give a resuscitation where airway, breathing and circulation are maintained. We send for investigation. We monitor the patient and give oxytocin infusion. If it is an atonic postpartum hemorrhage, we give uterotonics like oxytocin infusion, ergometrin IV or IM, prostaglandin analogs. And if still it bleeds, we can go for quantum tamponade and still bleeding, we can go for surgical methods or angiographic embolization. If it is a retained placenta, we have to manually remove it. If it is an inversion of uterus, we can go for replacement like O'Sullivan's hydrostatic method and if it still bleeds, go for surgery. If it is a DIC, we can correct it with blood or blood products. If it is a traumatic postpartum hemorrhage, repair the injury. And this is the summary of the PPH management. And this is the end of our topic. Remembering you, a woman is the full circle. Within her is the power to create, nurture and transform. And this is your Medical Mallu. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe.